When it comes to heavy lifting in Star Citizen, few ships can do it better than the Hercules Star Lifter, and even fewer can do it in quite so much style. We've had cargo ships before in Star Citizen, but few have matched the beauty or size that the Hercules Starlifter offers to potential pilots. And in this 313-1 release, we're getting both the M2 and C2 variants, with the A2 being left for later this year. And so in this installment of an Architect Reviews, I'm going to take you guys through both ships, both inside and out, letting you know the successes and failures as always, so you can decide whether or not this ship is for you. And as always, if you guys think I did a good job by the end and you think I deserve it, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button and to also check out my Twitch channel in the description. Being the second ship from the Crusader series of ships to be introduced into Star Citizen, the Starlifter no longer bears the burden of having to establish a design language for the manufacturer. However, it does bear the burden of having to translate that language into something larger. Luckily, much of this language was already established in the original concept art for the ship, which, like the Star Runner, is very close to what we actually got in the game. And I think that this speaks volumes about the success of its design from the get-go that even after many iterations, few features have actually changed on its design when it finally arrived this past week in the game. Which I personally think is a really good thing because I liked the concept art. I liked the long overhanging cockpit with the counterbalancing tail fins that really stuck out from the rear. This gives it a really pleasant avian look, especially when its VTOL engines are deployed on the wings. One departure from the concept art though is the way the weapons are integrated into the hull. Originally they were integrated into the black strip. Instead, now they appear out of a bulge on the side of the hull. The original was far more successful in avoiding breaking up its beautiful lines by hiding it in a darker color. Now instead, it's much more obvious when these things are deployed, making them far more visually disruptive to the otherwise beautifully smooth exterior. Now it feels a little bit more like a growth than anything else. Unlike the C2 variant, the M2 variant boasts an additional turret underneath the nose of the ship, and visually I find it to be an improvement over the original design, being far more streamlined though it would be cool if it could fold away. One thing that has remained the same from its original concept, but could have been improved, was the rear-facing turret. While in your mind it might make sense to have an only rear-facing turret to defend yourself, in reality it's mostly obstructed by the hull, both below it and by the fins. For a position just a little higher, it would have had a little bit more versatility to be able to face forward with the rest of the turrets, giving it a lot more firepower. This change could have made the ship far more potent when going up against ships directly in front of it, allowing it to bring all six size 4 weapons to bear on a single target. If you're curious though where the other size 4 turret is, it's attached to the bottom of the ship, and it actually does fold out so it can face forward, unlike the rear upper turret. But if you're buying a Hercules, you're probably not too concerned about how much it can dish out damage, you're probably more concerned about how it can hold all your cargo and transport your troops to the front line. One of the cool things about the Hercules is that it actually has a ramp that opens to both the rear and the front, allowing for a pass through of vehicles, also allowing for loading in unusual situations where either the rear or front would be more ideal, such as when you land on a battlefield and you want to deploy the tanks directly in front of the ship while the ship provides support. Thankfully though, if you're just looking to pilot this beast, you've got a drop down elevator that will take you directly to the command deck. So that's an improvement over ships like the Carrick and even the Star Runner. But we've spent enough time on the exterior of this ship. Why don't we take a look at the interior of the M2 and C2 variants to see how they differ and where their successes and failures lie. First of all though, I wanna note just how darn cool these massive doors are. Have a listen.
For a cargo vessel, the interior is really well lit and comfortably designed. But none of this takes away from the fact that the C2 can hold 672 SCU of cargo to the Caterpillar's 576. With the military variant holding just a little bit less cargo at 468, making it inferior to the Caterpillar for cargo hauling. Going back to design though, I really like the attention to detail when it comes to the floor plating. While I have no experience in aeronautical engineering, I can appreciate the fact that they added things like tie downs in a special area specifically designed for the Novatang's treads to find purchase here on the slick metallic surface. This attention to detail continues throughout the ship, where mechanicals are routinely revealed, selling the believability of the ship overall. But more than selling believability, it serves as a device to break down the space visually, giving a much more readable scale relative to the size of a player. Even more accomplished though, and further proving just how good CIG are getting at this, the lighting in this space is superb. There's a lot of contrast and interesting lighting fixtures that are well integrated into the design and don't feel tacked on. I particularly like the red accent at the end of the cargo lift here. It really helps cap off the space in a successful way. Speaking of lighting though, one of the other really cool features you'll find on board the Starlifter is to be able to change the lighting states of each and every room independently of the power being on or off. This is actually rather new and was first introduced with the Star Runner, the first of the Crusader ship series to be introduced in Star Citizen. Functionality though is also an important part of design and here too the Hercules does well. It can not only fit Nova tanks and ballistas comfortably, but it can double as a pocket carrier should you wish to try it. But this isn't an oversight or an accident on CIG's part. This is actually part of the design. One of the other purposes of the C2 is to transport racing teams to different tracks in the verse and one of the racing craft that it's meant to fit is the P-52 Merlin and those also double as nice little fighter craft, so you can actually experience a bit of carrier gameplay right now in Star Citizen if you have a friend who owns one of these or if you buy one yourself. The only thing you'll probably need is a community to help fly them with you. Maybe you can try out Armco in the Discord if you're interested. <laughs> okay, okay, you caught me. That's my own community. I'm plugging it in my own video. Can you blame me? Alright, so if you want to get to the rest of the ship, you actually can choose one of two options. You can go up the cargo lift, or you can go up the manual ladder, which is a nice touch. One of the nice features of the cargo lift, though, is it serves as an airlock between the cargo bay, should it become decompressed, as well as from the outside, which could be a low oxygen or no oxygen environment. The ladder, on the other hand, is a great way to access the upper deck should the power go out, but I think one of the other things it does really well is serve as a great way to get down to the cargo area in a jiffy if you slide down the ladder by holding shift. But now let's head up the lift and check out the rest of the upper deck. One of the things that first hit me about this deck was just how spacious it felt. I had thought to experience tight corridors considering most of the ships we've seen in Star Citizen, but I was pleasantly surprised to find a bright, well-lit, comfortably sized space, which continues the design style that we'd seen in the Mercury Star Runner in a very successful way. Once again, the lighting here is extremely well integrated into the paneling, into the design. Everything feels like it fits. It's part of the same language, and I really appreciate that attention to detail. I also really like how the structure of the ship helps to define the space and separate the different areas. Another dominant feature of the space is this center mound area that seems to have access paneling. This is actually for components as well as personal storage. It also has in the center of it access to what I think is the engine. You can gain access to this through a catwalk that you'll find in either one of two places in the ship. This also gives you a view into one of the strangest parts of the design of this ship, uh, the Singularity? I, I don't know what this is. Maybe it allows you to see into the future, like when Star Citizen's going to be released. Oof. But it's blinding and has cool cables going into it, so it's gotta be important, right? Walking down its well-lit and comfortably sized corridor, you'll find at either end of the hallway opposite to the bridge, an area where you can access the larger modules of the ship, which are fully exposed. This is fine because this is more of an industrial ship, but I can at least appreciate that it's separated from the cargo area, unlike some ships. Looking at you, Aegis. But now let's go check out where the crew gets some rack time on long journeys in the habitation area of the upper deck. One thing that really surprised me about this space was just how much smaller it is 
than the corridor space that we were just walking around in. It is very modest in size, but I suppose everything is relative and it's big compared to a lot of other ships, so I'll let it slide. For the M2 variant, you've got three bunks, the C2 is only two bunks, but in both cases they're about this size, just big enough to be comfortable. The crew also gets their own area to communicate with the outside world or to just catch up on their reading. But I really like how this bed area is actually designed. You've got plenty of storage and you also have this fantastic little lighting setup, which is again a first for Star Citizen. Being able to set different light levels for where you sleep is pretty cool. Although you, you're not really sleeping in the video game, it's just a nice little detail touch. Waste closets can be found through these unusually shaped doors, which contour the shape of the room, this cylindrical style, which we've seen appear already on the Mercury Star Runner. I quite like it. It feels very well integrated. And the shower stall is just big enough to use for a single person. I am again very surprised that they didn't utilize more space on board to make this just a little bit bigger because, well, they've got the space. And just in case you're curious, here's what it looks like in its low light state. This is the sort of state you might have when everyone's sleeping. Looks kind of cool. But now let's head across the deck to the port side of the ship where we can tour the auxiliary crew section of the M2 variant. In this area, you'll find a bunch of jump seats which have drop-down bars to hold the occupants in place in case of turbulence or in case of having to perform maneuvers to get to an LZ covered by anti-air. To the rear of this deck, you'll find the armory, which is where your marines will get themselves suited up and ready to go once they actually are about to be deployed. You've got two lockers, weapon lockers, and even some shelves for extra storage, and these will come in handy when we have physicalized inventory later this year. But there's a pretty big issue with this entire space, and it doesn't have anything to do with the wonderful detailing, like this grip here on the floor to prevent you from slipping on the otherwise slick steel surface. It's a problem with what we call in the trade program adjacency. When architects and designers design spaces, they consider what program is best suited to be next to another, or what the proper adjacency should be. Things like emergency egress or exiting and occupancy or the amount of people in a space must also be considered to properly size a doorway and the way that occupants will exit in case of that emergency. In the case of these drop seats, it's clear that they're meant to be used while dropping into the LZ as they've got those drop down bars. And yet when you need to actually deploy, when you get on the ground, you all have to fit through either a ladder or a slow cargo lift to actually get down to the cargo bay to deploy with the rest of the vehicles. In emergencies, you can't expect people to be able to go through a space single file so easily. I imagine that there's going to be jam ups and people are going to get stuck and it's going to hold up the whole operation. The optimal location would have been down here in the cargo bay along one of these walls where the marines could have easily deployed once you hit the LZ immediately with the rest of the vehicles instead of having to fit through that tiny little ladder. This would have freed up that auxiliary crew section to actually be used for bunks and maybe a small kitchenette instead of the jump seats. Because if you think about it, in what scenario would the marines ever come aboard without their armor or their weapons already equipped, as there's no place for them to stay long term? They'd likely only be on board for that very quick deployment from a forward operating base to the LZ, so there'd be no use for this room whatsoever. This is a pretty massive flaw that I hope they correct at some point in the future. Otherwise, this is just going to be a glorified, oversized personal inventory for the owner of the ship, and that's it. Luckily, the civilian variant of the ship, or the C2, does not share this flaw, as this space is instead occupied by a recreation area for the crew, such as an area to sit down to dine with the rest of the crew, a kitchenette to fix up that food, and even an area to catch up on the latest episode of your favorite show. But now let's head forward to check out the parts just behind the bridge. Before we get there, we'll head down a long corridor which gives us access to additional components. We'll also see a really cool lighting scheme return from what we'd seen in the MSR, the Mercury Star Runner, which I really, really like. And again, we're seeing a lot of the layering techniques we saw in that initial design where you've got these smooth panels, which are interrupted by mechanicals that poke out here and there. I really like how the light on the floor comes up and meets the door and goes around it and continues around the room uninterrupted. In the final compartment before we hit the bridge, we'll find the escape pods, and if you have the C2 variant, some additional suit lockers. Because this is a dropship, it's got additional escape pods for those marines, just in case things really do go wrong. They also double as a nice little holding area for the Linus Sebastians of your group. But now, let's take a look at the bridge.
The bridge of any vessel is easily one of the coolest places on the ship, and this ship is no exception. The Hercules signature wraparound viewport is beautiful from the interior. I love how the dashboard and the paneling all wrap around the occupants, the pilots. It feels so cozy to be in this space. It makes you want to operate this vessel. There's something also very familiar about it. It kind of looks like a modern aircraft cockpit, albeit with far better visibility. Like the rest of the ship, the lighting on the floor wraps up and hits the ceiling and feels a part of the design. It accentuates the shape of the interior, the shape of the structure. And CIG never fails to impress with the level of detail down to the textures of each flight seat. While the C2 variant only has the pilot and co-pilot seat, the M2 variant adds in a turret gunner operator seat. Also, probably doubles as an engineer's seat when not using the turret. Finally, a bridge that feels like it doesn't waste too much space. It also has a bit of an easter egg for a drawer that pops out underneath that center console. This is actually where you can put pistols in case you're boarded. I think it's a really well situated weapon locker, and I'd like to see more stuff like this in the future for other ships. Operation of the vessel is pretty basic, but the flight seat's operation is pretty unique. It's on a very long track that brings you up to the operator's position, and, well, some people like it, some people hate it, but it's actually been there since the concept, and personally, I find it to be a unique feature that gives it a little bit more personality. Being 70 meters wide, it's just at the boundary of what's possible for a regular large hangar, and so getting in and out can sometimes be a bit of a task, but if you've got experience flying large vessels, you shouldn't have too much of an issue. She flies fairly well, and acceleration is impressive for its size. In conclusion then, the C2 is a very well-designed ship, while the M2, on the other hand, has some pretty significant flaws that I went over earlier in this video. Which is a real shame, because I would have probably rated this as one of my most favorite designs in the entire game were it not for these issues. So let's hope that they go back and fix the M2 up just a little bit to bring it up to snuff with the C2, which is, I think, pretty darn near perfect. But that's it for this episode of An Architect Reviews. If you want to see more, you know what to do. Hope to see you next time. Fly safe.